Hi, I'm Jim Salscheider, Executive Director of the Lake Havasu City Main Street Program. For the next few minutes, we're going to explore the vision for the future of our city. For over 30 years, the American Institute of Architects has offered a RUDAT program, the Regional Urban Design Assistance Team. More than 150 cities have been visited by RUDAT teams, professional architects, planners, economists, and urban experts that conducted intensive studies of target areas. then delivered specific recommendations to meet the challenges of the host communities. Here in Lake Havasu City, the visiting RUDAT team focused on the McCulloch Boulevard area from Acoma west to Smoke Tree, an area that has aged, even become a bit run down with the migration of some retail businesses and economic energy. While a young community, Lake Havasu has undergone much change. Before we decide where we are going, let's look back at where we have been. Native Americans were the earliest residents along the shores of the Colorado River. Semi-nomadic Mojaves built their homes from the materials they found in their environment. They wove baskets and made earthenware pottery from native clays and soils. They raised corn, beans, wheat, squash, and melons. They raised turkeys and tamed wild dogs for pets and hunting companions. The Chimuaves migrated from the north. Hunter-gatherers, they worked with buckskin and produced fine willow baskets from the river's reeds. As white men migrated west, life for the Mojaves and Chimuaves changed forever. In 1859, the U.S. Army established a reservation near Parker. The Colorado River Indian Tribes Reservation, or CRIT, today is the homeland of Hopi and Navajo peoples as well. The Chimuaves also occupied 36,000 acres directly across from Lake Havasu in California. The blue waters of Lake Havasu drive our thriving tourism industry today. But a hundred years ago, miners flocked to what would become Lake Havasu City in search of silver, gold, lead, copper, and graphite. As early as 1890, gold was being harvested from Crossman Peak. Active mining operations continued into the 1930s, and even today, modern-day prospectors sift the sands and rocks, modern-day metal detectors replacing pickaxes and shovels. At about the time that mining was winding down, a new pot of gold was about to be built along the Colorado River. Booming Southern California needed water. The mighty Colorado River had plenty. The solution was a huge reservoir. What would become Parker Dam had its beginnings in 1931. A.E. Bud Graham began surveying a location for the dam north of Parker. In 1938, the dam was finished and Lake Havasu was born. Within four years, water was flowing to Southern California for agriculture in the Imperial Valley and for the growing communities of Los Angeles and San Diego. Drivers along Highway 95 can see what appear to be giant straws dipping into the lake from the western cliffside. The Whitsett pumping station draws thousands of gallons an hour up through more than 300 feet of pipes. Water eventually arrives at Lake Matthews near Riverside, California for delivery to LA and San Diego. In 1985, the Southern Arizona Project provided precious water to thirsty Phoenix and Tucson. And on the southern end of the lake, the Parker Power Plant houses four hydroelectric generators. Water leaving Parker Dam turns the dynamos that power the Whitsett pumping station and the surrounding communities. The modern history of Lake Havasu City actually began on what is now the island. World War II opened the first chapter in the story of Lake Havasu City. As America's war machine accelerated, mining in the Chimuavi Mountains was halted. The area converted to a gunnery range for the Army Air Force. One of several emergency landing fields along the river was built on what is now the island, along with a rest and convalescence camp, still called Site 6 to this day. Thousands of soldiers enjoyed the facilities during the war. At war's end, Vic and Corrine Spratt converted Site 6 to a fishing camp. Many GIs with fond memories of the area returned to visit the area's pioneer resort. A chance flyby changed the area from a remote, sleepy desert shoreline to what now is a fast-growing metropolitan area. In 1958, industrialist Robert McCulloch was in the hunt for a testing facility for his outboard motor company. Flying over, McCulloch spotted Site 6, landed, and within three days struck a deal to buy the surrounding land for $300,000. In 1959, McCulloch hit upon a plan to move his manufacturing facilities from expensive Southern California and create a new community, Lake Havasu City. Engineer and colleague C.V. Wood was a bit skeptical at first, 
creating a town out of raw desert? It seemed far-fetched to Wood at first, but as he crunched the numbers, it began to make sense. Wood, one of the geniuses that helped create Disneyland, put his design expertise to work on McCulloch's dream. By 1964, what we would recognize as Lake Havasu City began to take shape. Two years later, a thousand people called Lake Havasu City home. 50 miles of pavement was down and utilities were in place. The first school in 1964. A year later, the first church. Also by 66, McCulloch had established his own airline, a fleet of planes to bring prospective buyers to this burgeoning oasis in the desert. More than 130,000 people flew in for a look. Many bought home sites to relocate or for future retirement homes. Where people come, business follows. Shops, offices, medical facilities sprouted up in the McCulloch Boulevard corridor. And that was just the beginning. The relocation of McCulloch's chainsaw manufacturing plant to Lake Havasu brought good paying jobs and job seekers. Other plants and employers followed McCulloch. At one point, McCulloch developed a gyroplane, hoping to create a market for personal aircraft, one of the few dreams that went unrealized. As word spread, homes began to creep ever further into the foothills and beyond. But McCulloch wasn't satisfied to create a new community from raw desert. By 1968, he was looking for an icon, a centerpiece to his creation. On a trip to New York City, C.V. Wood learned that the London Bridge was for sale. The 130-year-old span was falling victim to modern traffic demands. What was an architectural wonder in the 1830s was antiquated and obsolete in the bustle of 1960s London traffic. The modern loads were literally driving the bridge into the mud of the Thames River. March 23, 1968, Robert McCulloch bought the bridge for $2.4 million. By July 4th, the first of hundreds of carefully marked and coated granite blocks arrived in Long Beach, California. July 9th, the first of the stones arrived in Lake Havasu at the base of the Pittsburgh Peninsula. Late that same year, the cornerstone was laid in ceremonies attended by the Lord Mayor of London, Sir Gilbert Inglefield. Work began in earnest to give birth to the new London Bridge. 33,000 tons of blocks were carefully fitted together, using the desert itself to provide a construction platform. Then later, two million cubic yards of earth were removed to create a bed for the soon to become Bridgewater Channel. By 1971, the work was done. The London Bridge was now at home in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Millions of people have visited this transplanted landmark. Tens of thousands have made Lake Havasu City their home too. Forty years have brought many changes to Lake Havasu City, not all of them positive. The Rudat team arrived with the McCulloch Boulevard area as their primary target, but quickly discovered that the challenge for Lake Havasu City as a whole should be viewed from four interlocking perspectives. Pima Wash, a geographic feature that runs through the heart of the community. Up to now, not much to look at. Highway 95, the primary traffic conduit leading in and out of the city. Newcomers see very little to entice them to stop and visit. Second Bridge. As Lake Havasu City grows and island development expands, a second access point is necessary. Demands on the primary bridge are exceeding its capacity. Rehabilitation of McCulloch Boulevard Corridor. A reinvention of the Main Street concept to attract a more vibrant business atmosphere and attract visitors and residents to this uptown area. That brings us to the Rudat team's visit. Longtime resident and local architect Jerry Clark, member of the American Institute of Architects, started the ball rolling. We needed that outside expertise to come in with no baggage. They uh, come in pro bono and they leave knowing they cannot accept a commission here. It's left now for us to develop, us the community. Martha Bennett worked with Clark to develop and submit a winning application. An incredible honor, really, for them to have chosen Lake Havasu City, but we do offer some unique um, things to a group like uh, the American Institute of Architects. Team leader Hunter G. visited in late 2006 to lay the groundwork for the project. When you get here, the, uh, the first impression is not so good in terms of the long I-95. Uh, it's not until you get to this place uh, and, and the heart of the community that you realize that there's some real promise. 
and that there's some really exciting things going on and that there's an amazing history about this place that we can, that we can build upon. Then in mid-February 2007, the whirlwind visit began. Four days to establish the challenges, determine the alternatives, then deliver a detailed report on what might be done. One of the earliest elements of the learning process involved the youngest minds in Lake Havasu. Team members James Abel and Chris Ackerman met with art students at Lake Havasu High School. Mr. McCullough had a vision for this place, but I think if he were alive today and could see this place, he'd be a little stunned at what this place became. Good that same day, Chris Ackerman and James Abel brought the Rudat message to the listeners of KNTR Radio's Speak Out. That evening, the team was introduced during a welcome dinner at the London Bridge Resort. Next morning, it was off to McCulloch Boulevard, a walking tour of our Main Street commercial area to learn the lay of the land and establish parameters for possible changes. The team asked questions, took pictures, and developed a palette for the scope of work. Then, that afternoon, an intensive succession of small focus groups led by members of the RUDAT team were held at the London Bridge Resort Convention Center. Focus group topics included redevelopment, challenges for our future, Main Street, where do we go, future of our city, the 40-year vision, mixed-use density, how do we do it, and public infrastructure, traffic and parking. Nearly 100 business and community leaders, as well as students from Mojave Community College and Lake Havasu High School, discussed the topics with an eye to meeting the needs of tomorrow's Lake Havasu City. The focus groups provided the RUDAT team members with a deeper insight into how the people living here feel about where we have been, where we are, and where we are going as a community. Saturday morning, the public arrived at the high school to share their unique points of view and add to the community montage that is Lake Havasu City. Dozens of people stood and voiced their concerns and suggestions. The specific suggestions were wide and varied. Most of those in attendance saw the need for what might be considered radical change for the future. Others voiced concerns that the personality of Lake Havasu City's past had been eroded by growth and a lack of planning and control. Above all, quality of life seemed to be at the forefront of most of the public's concerns for Lake Havasu City's future. With the data gathering complete, the task of putting a plan together began in earnest. A conference room at the London Bridge Resort was converted into an information technology center. Computers, and lots of space for maps, drawings, discussions, debates, and intellectual reflection gave way to the seeds of creativity of what Lake Havasu City might be tomorrow. Data that former Councilman and Project historian Bruce Hinman is archiving for present day and future use. They'll call it a historian, a gatherer of information, a uh, disseminator of the same, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that's part of my job. The other part of my job is getting the word out as to what RUDAT and uh, Connecting Havasu is all about. The team worked nearly round the clock to develop a concept for the now redesignated uptown area of the city. Main Street became the new working name for McCulloch Boulevard. As night fell on Sunday, the team worked on compiling and condensing their impressions, observations, and conclusions into a single document, a report to the people of Lake Havasu City. Monday evening, the team gathered in the high school performing arts center to reveal their findings. Thank you, Hunter, and good evening. So as Hunter was talking about, we had kind of a difficult time defining the study area. But the heart of the city is really from the island on up to the municipal complex. So as we think about this here, we have to think about how to be bold, how to have some vision. You have the right idea, you have the right challenge, off we go. We'll find the money, we'll find the way. So Hunter talked a little bit about how we're going to deal with this big, bad state highway. You come into town and this is the image of your city. Could come a time, I know it sounds foolhardy, but it could come a time when that underpass could be completely filled in and the state highway could be put at grade. And now when people want to come to McCullough, our main street, they don't just zip right by it and miss it entirely. 
This wonderful green sward is a piece of urban land that no one would have thought that we could have reclaimed. And yet here it is. It's a diamond in the rough to be mined and polished and used by this, the citizens of this good town. Hunter had a stroke of genius. He called it Bridge Park. Opportunity exists to take the state highway back onto Lake Havasu Avenue in such a way that the entire area could be traffic free. This is another park proposal. Of course, we've got another uh, challenge ahead of us in the fact that we need to build a second bridge. Well, it's a far-fetched idea, but what a neat idea to think about how this could be the 21st century counterpart. These wonderful cable stay bridges are marvels of modern technology. What a better way to say to your kids and your grandkids, we're a progressive community, we care about our future, and we are going to be leaders of the 21st century. Okay, here's a fun one. Let's call it what it is. For not very much money, you can have Main Street be Main Street. So when a visitor comes on the state highway, they instantly see that's Main. I might want to go see what's on Main Street. As a matter of fact, what is that thing called the McCullough Mile? I'm curious about that. We want to have gateways and pylons that announce your arrival to our special new uptown district. Here's a really simple one. A couple simple pylons or flagpoles could be erected and different colored banners could be added from time to time. So here's a radical vision for Main Street. Let's bring the river right on up Main Street. We believe that we can achieve a landscape median about 10 feet wide that goes down Main Street. And this would include a bike lane and it would include parallel parking on both sides. And it allows us to bring native Arizona cottonwoods into our city. I'm also going to celebrate the river by bringing river run rock into the median. Maybe some riparian grasses and other native Arizona species. We also have some palm tree opportunities. It wouldn't cost much to be bold with palm trees. We have a beautiful, beautiful road that looks off from downtown Mulberry Avenue. You all know it. Here's a chance to be bold with Mulberry and frame those wonderful views to the river. Also, Main Street cross, crosses the Pima Wash. This is a wonderful opportunity. This is where urbanism meets the natural world. We could come and use that entire bridge deck as a civic plaza. There could be a really neat thing with uh, the opportunity to have a little street life. So here's a little sketch of the very same bridge. We put a new balustrade on it. We've got some lights that are fun and interesting and some colorful banners. And here you can see uh, an achievable uh, idea in the sense that we could have landscaping, desert Sonoran landscaping to tell the story of this region with bicycle paths. I understand with the completion of the sewer system you're going to have more effluent than you know what to do with and we need to figure out ways to use that creatively. It just might be that we're able to pump some of that up above our downtown, now called Uptown, and let that trickle on down the Pima Wash <coughs> and let it have some waterfalls and some sound and some cooling effects. And we could bring sculpture, fun sculpture, things that people would come and see. You could have a nature trail and you could teach and tell the story of the desert critters and the desert plants and maybe even the desert geology. We have uh, the opportunity to create these kivas along the Pima Wash. It's a wonderful opportunity to join the urbanism of the town and where the town meets nature. And we could even, uh, again, celebrate our, our river legacy with river run rocks and sculptural pylons. So here's a grand vision for the Pima Wash. Why don't we have new developments orient not only to Main Street, but take advantage of this wonderful Pima Wash that could be a natural counterpart to the town. Here's our little splash park. Bring your toddler to downtown in the summertime, buy some ice cream, 
get wet, and have a ball. This is an example of how we may even do well to embrace higher learning in downtown. It seems to me to become a complete city, we need to have major educational opportunities downtown. You've got tremendous potential. It's been a thrill to be with you. Thank you. Presently, there is um, the building heights in downtown or uptown are 25 feet. And we are proposing that buildings could be as tall as 60 feet, uh, which is equivalent to a four-story building in the uptown area. Residential living is prohibited for some reason uh, in the commercial area. Uh, but the residences would have to be on the, on the upper stories because the, the first story is critically important that they have lively uh, types of businesses, shops and restaurants and nightclubs that's going to draw people not only during the day but in the evening hours. Some of the things that um, Lake Havasu City could have is a little more shade. Uh, that maybe some colonnades and some balconies that would hang over the sidewalk would be a, a good idea. If you want to really create a really walkable community, there's a number of things you have to do. One of the most paramount things to do is to put the building next to the sidewalk. Uh, I saw quite a few uh, places in the, in the uptown area where the sidewalk uh, was uh, fronted with a parking lot and the building sat deeply back. and. Um, to get to the storefront, you'd have to squint to see what is in the storefront windows, and you'd have to maneuver yourself between cars and avoid the greasy patch to get into the store. And pedestrians love to walk if they're entertained. So if you have shops next to the sidewalk and the storefronts are full of really great things and there's restaurants and, and all sorts of activities, uh, Americans will actually walk more than a, a quarter mile. Lake Havasu City is growing at a phenomenal rate, but you have to think about where do you want that growth? Do you want the town to keep on expanding outward? Uh, we think that Main Street should be a really lively street and it should have, um, as I mentioned before, the types of shops and, and activities that are gonna draw you there on a daily basis and have you come in the evening. But we feel that when you're along um, Swanson and um, Mesquite, these are opportunities for some higher density residential. And again, we're thinking at this time that a four-story building would be very appropriate. You do have some awnings and you do have some balconies. Uh, these balconies are really pretty good because they put, they put you out in front of the building that you would great, would enhance some new views that you never had before. We're at a crossroad and we really do need to take the path to a better future. I don't want this opportunity to pass us by, and as Hunter said, we all need to get involved, and I can assure you that I, you have my personal commitment that I will get personally involved in seeing this through. It will take many, many years. I will be long gone as mayor by the time everything gets implemented, but we can set that path today, and that's what we need to do. Much has been written about this RUDET report, and much has been said as well, and so it should. It is a remarkable report, as a vision document should be. Can these recommendations really be accomplished? Some can, and some will take time. As we move forward, we may find an even better idea here or there, but we must try. Our city and our children are betting their future on us. It's been more than 40 years since our last vision, and now it's time to plan and execute our next 40. I'm Jim Salscheider, and thank you for watching.